what we're trying to do uh, now in choral space uh, online, digital uh, memory, uh, is to have movement through a space be an act of reasoning by which a person could, uh, could think about and understand and reason about problems and, and the world. Uh, we took um, a situationist approach to this. The situationists, um, situation, situationist international, uh, was a movement, an avant-garde movement of sort of anti-urbanism uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, very much uh, part of what led to the famous May 68. Uh, rebellions in Europe and in America too for that matter, uh, but the situationists uh, uh, applied uh, poetry to life and they were um, uh, had, a, had a plan of moving through a city looking for its uh, situations as they said uh, or even to create situations and their, their methodology is very important to the, the research ensembles methodologies. Uh, because uh, they had this idea of, of drifting, they called it the derive, uh, which was uh, a kind of open passage, ignoring the normal traffic flows and circulations uh, of the planned urban developments, and instead uh, moving through the city in a way that followed its uh, moods, that tried to track its emotions, uh, the feeling and atmosphere of a place, uh, to find what they called the plaque tournant, which are these turntables or hubs uh, or vortices, which were the centers of, of power, if you like, uh, where a lot of forces uh, came together to create strong atmosphere. Uh, so, for example, when we're talking about moving through, uh, drifting through the zone, uh, walking, uh, whether that's a drift or a situation, uh, in a topological sense, uh, moving through a space, uh, something like the Aboriginal dream time is uh, a very good model for what we're trying to do. Um, to, to find a digital equivalent, we can learn from the way the Aborigines uh, mapped uh, fully their cosmology and their mythology onto the landscape in which they lived. And as no nomads, they would uh, do their walkabouts or they would do their tours of their space uh, and, and their memory system was uh, that as they came to each of their sacred spots, uh, the wise man or woman would tell the tales, uh, tell the stories that were cued or triggered by the landscape in that particular place. Uh, and so as they moved through the seasons, moved through their space, there was a kind of a, a cognitive map or an allegory or a mystery that was formed, a collective uh, story. Uh, in which uh, the culture and civilization and the landscape that the people moved through were one and the same. Uh, the uh, what I'm I'm interested in figurative language, uh, especially metaphor, and just the translation of metaphor in Greek means to carry across. And if you translate metaphor into Latin, it translates as transfer, which literally means to carry across. The Latin for uh, carry or bear is ferro ferra tuli latus and actually translation is the same as transfer just uses a different principal part at the uh, tail end of the word so uh, there is there are equations between the word metaphor transfer and translation and they're all uh, connected in the sense of literally meaning to carry across There's, uh, of course, another model for this, uh, again, that we're looking at and learning from. Uh, we call these relays, 
a relay is not exactly a model. A model is something that you take over whole, whole cloth and, and just try to repeat it. But what a relay does is, is it gives you an idea of a direction that you want to go in. You don't want to replicate uh, the thing completely, uh, but you want to learn from it and, in order to do your own thing. Well, another relay for, uh, for the Cora is mnemonic uh, memory systems, and especially medieval culture, manuscript culture, uh, from the Romans uh, through to the beginning of print, uh, the way schooling worked uh, in, uh, in church schools and universities uh, in Europe at that time was uh, uh, that students were trained in memory. So if you think about what metaphor is actually doing in language, it's carrying across some sense of meaning from one word to another. It's, and it's, uh, I mean, that's the fundamental function of language, you think about it. So, uh, for example, if you have uh, metaphor I, or my love is a rose, there's something about the love, your lover, that's being compared to a rose. So something about the rose is being carried across to the lover. Now, if you're interpreting that poem, it's up to you what you carry across, whether it's the beautiful smell or the, the thorn, the sharp thorn. And you built a memory theater uh, in order to uh, be able to perform, uh, give speeches. Uh, that's the way. Uh, that's the way uh, performance was measured. That's the, that were the, the practices of schooling and of learning in uh, in a manuscript culture were not writing, uh, but they were speaking. You had to be able to speak. You had to be able to argue, uh, debate, um, persuade, and you had to hold forth without writing for hours at a time. Sometimes. The other interesting thing about metaphor is not only are you carrying across meaning, uh, but you're crossing an implied space. So it's this notion of spatiality that interests me also. And uh, I like, there's been some work done on that, cognitive science, uh, work of Mark Turner uh, in literary minds and George Lakoff, Mark Johnson in a book called Philosophy in the Flesh. Uh, talk about cognitive metaphors, the metaphors we live by. So, and he talks about there being the, the body, since the body has a brain that lives in a three-dimensional space, it incorporates three-dimensionality and in motion into uh, its metaphorical concepts. So for example, in the metaphorical concept of thinking as moving, the mind is a body and ideas are locations. So in the act of thinking, you're in a, in a metaphorical sense moving your mind, move, moving your mind to different locations in, in your brain, so to speak. And this is actually a fundamental notion of memory that goes all the way back 2,500 years 
in Greek rhetoric. My twin four-year-olds attend a preschool just up the hill here and this bridge will be out for four more years so by the time the bridge is ready to be used again they'll be in second or third grade but right now what we have to do to take them to the school is instead of simply coming down the hill as we walk today and crossing this bridge and going on up the hill, we have to go all the way around to the next bridge. It takes, and it takes about an extra 10 to 15 minutes to actually get them there. <laughs> 